Hi, my name is Vanessa Moss and I'm a member of the organizing committee. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wadjuri Yamachi people as the traditional owners of the land on which the ASCAP telescope, which you see behind me, is hosted and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Professor Ron Ekers is a CSIRO fellow and an adjunct professor at Curtin University in Perth. He's had a career spanning many countries, including the UK, the Netherlands and the US, and he came back to Australia in 1988 to be the first director of the Australia Telescope National Facility, which operates CSIRO's radio observatories. From 2003 to 2006, he was the president of the International Astronomical Union, which is the worldwide body that governs professional astronomers. He's a member of the Royal Society, the Australian Academy of Science, the Royal Dutch Academy of Science, and the US National Academy of Science. He is a pillar of modern radio astronomy and an immense source of wisdom. So I'm very excited to introduce you to him today. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Vanessa, for that introduction. My talk is on the evolution of scientific meetings. So why give a talk about meetings? I have been, uh, I've had a career in radio astronomy, um, academic scientific research. And I've been attending scientific meetings, many countries around the world since about 1963. So as we are entering this new virtual meeting age and the new technology, I thought it would be interesting to think about what has happened over the last five decades. I've attended hundreds of face-to-face -face international meetings, and I have now attended one virtual international meeting a few months ago. So as you will see, my knowledge is very much based on the conventional face-to-face -face meeting style. I've also been involved in the organization of global collaboration in science. I was president of the International Astronomical Union, 2003, uh, which is one of the suite of scientific unions uh, under the umbrella of the International Council of Scientific Unions, uh, a vaguely UN-like uh, structure. The IAU was established back in 1919 and has been uh, primarily involved in facilitating collaboration globally in the field of astronomy. I've also worked in uh, four different countries during my career and a number of different organizations. So why should we discuss the history of scientific meetings? As a now increasingly involved in recording the history of the development of science. I like quotes like George Centignana's, if you cannot remember what happened, uh, you will be condemned to repeat it. So I don't intend to make this a debate on the face-to-face -face versus virtual meeting issue, but instead to go through what we can learn from our past experiences, and of course, what failures we can avoid as we start implementing new technology. Over five decades, technology changes drastically, and so I will also be showing how that has affected the way meetings have uh, been held. And we also have a question of why do we hold meetings at all? And how can we measure the success of the meetings? We won't be able to have measures of success unless we can agree on why we hold the meetings in the first place. Uh, obviously, the main justification for most scientific meetings is scientific collaboration. The meeting itself will publish 
series of paper presentations. So a straightforward measure would be to count the citations to the papers given at the meetings. This is probably not a particularly useful measure because conference meetings can be rather ephemeral and the citation impact takes a long time to build up. So conference publications don't usually feature very well. We could have a look at scientific collaborations which have been triggered by these specific meetings. And then we could look at the bibliometric impact of those collaborations. This is possibly one of the best ways to measure the success, but it's not without its difficulty because you would have to separate out the collaborations which are actually triggered by the meeting. For me, one of the more important roles of meetings is to stimulate research innovation. We know that when we bring people uh, together, especially from different areas or different disciplines, that triggers innovations, new ideas, and new collaborations develop. So perhaps after meetings, we could measure how many new collaborations came into existence. And I always like to ask myself after a meeting, do I have any new ideas? Have I thought of things which I would not have thought of if I hadn't gone to that meeting? But difficult to measure. Meetings in foreign countries expose us to different cultures. We became, we, be, we appreciate better the, uh, and have friends uh, all over the world. So perhaps a rather, for an internationalist like me, uh, I think scientific collaboration through such meetings as we are holding actually decreases the number of wars. But I don't propose we use that as the measure. Uh, the other thing that is most noticeable about a meeting is that it is a time when we can stimulate our imagination uh, by listening to exciting new discoveries in science. Here's an image which may well be presented at a meeting. It's a Hubble Space Telescope image in the black and white background of galaxies and stars. And in the galaxy in the center, there's a black hole. That black hole is spewing out jets of plasma which are emitting radio waves, which we see in the red. A striking image uh, discovered by the VLA uh, with its incredible smoke ring-like structure, telling us something about the history of what's been happening in the center of this galaxy. You come away from a conference seeing new dramatic results like this, and it stimulates our imagination and is what drives us, I think, to continue in the field of scientific research. Some meetings are quite different. Certainly the biggest impact meeting uh, I have been involved in was the uh, 26th General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union, which occurred while I was president, so under my leadership. Uh, and was held in Prague, 14th to the 25th of August, 2006. One item on the agenda for that meeting was to resolve a nomenclature issue as to what was a planet and what was uh, a smaller object in the solar system. And of course, the, while the scientific discussion was general, the question which uh, arose was related to whether Pluto uh, would still be called a planet. So the meeting included the usual scientific discussions um, um, between scientists, planetary scientists, but it also had a decision-making requirement that at the end of this, these discussions, there would be a resolution uh, and the definition of the planet uh, would be made in this uh, resolution. 
Uh, in order to do this, uh, bringing people together globally in such a international Congress is an extremely important step. Um, these tend to be fairly fancy meetings, as you can see from the image on the right, which is, I think, uh, the opening part of the opening ceremony. Uh, but on the left, we see the resolution of whether Pluto was to be remain a planet or not been taken. Uh, it was quite a tricky process because we had the members of the Union uh, vote on such scientific issues. Um, and we had to decide first whether we would have electronic voting so the people not present in Prague could participate. We decided not to do that because they would not have observed the very uh, vigorous debate which took place between the different parties. So we would do a vote in Prague, but because this was a rather hot topic of great interest to the press, we had hundreds of reporters converged on this General Assembly and joined the meeting. And we didn't want to have the key discussions done in secret, so we allowed them into the conference hall but then how could we vote uh, in a way which had only the members voting? Uh, the answer turned out to be pretty simple. Uh, IEU members were issued with yellow cards and at the time for the vote, they raised the cards and they were counted. Old fashioned, extremely effective, and it enabled the non-members who wanted to participate in this discussion to be there, but it did not allow them to distort the vote. So now to uh, a look at the ways which technology uh, has changed the meetings. Uh, scientific meetings with large audiences need very good display facilities. So uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people in a large lecture theater can, um, can uh, see the information being displayed. And here the technology has changed dramatically. When I started in this business in the 1960s, images would be prepared on glass three by four inch slides, um, a, a somewhat time consuming process, but nevertheless, the quality of the images was quite high. And for astronomers where we work uh, with images of the sky, that's rather important. In about 1970, uh, these were replaced by the much more convenient 35 millimeter slides, uh, and they continued to be the dominant uh, display uh, uh, media for decades. Uh, the projectors were now small. Uh, they could be operated remotely, so that it means the lecturer could be changing the slides himself or herself. And uh, the other dramatic change was that you could have multiple projectors and multiple screens. And for, um, for, for talks which required a lot of visual material, uh, the multiple projectors um, was, was very effective. You could have multiple screens, typically an image on one screen and some text describing it on another. So I believe this was uh, very successful. And I have marked uh, in yellow the good points, uh, which uh, I want to uh, bring up in the lessons learned at the end. Uh, the other, uh, Projection device was the famous overhead projector. There's one shown there on the right in case very young people may not be familiar with this. And you would have transparent sheets which you put on the overhead projector and it would project onto a large screen. Uh, it was flexible. You could produce these at a very short time scale. You could even write on the uh, overhead during your talk so you could uh, change things in real time. This was a period in which people with artistic ability would do the most fantastic hand-drawn overheads. 
to make uh, the point that they were making in their presentation. Uh, and some of these uh, are so memorable, I can still see these spectacular uh, hand-drawn images being put on the overhead projector. Uh, but it became possible to use copy machines to copy documents onto transparencies, and so that rather quickly displaced the hand-drawn overheads. Uh, and then finally, uh, you could generate them directly uh, as a computer output. Uh, at about the same time, oh, well, at, as soon as you have a computer generated output, this is now in the mid 90s, uh, you have the power of the computer to generate your overheads. They can become much more complex. Uh, you can incorporate images into the overheads very easily. And so platforms and software was developed to do this. And the famous Microsoft PowerPoint came into existence at this time. Um, it had huge impact because it was well designed for incorporating uh, a modest amount of text reduced to dot points typically, which is exactly what you're looking at in my presentation now, uh, and incorporating images. The downside is that the diversity of the hand-drawn transparencies rapidly disappeared. And now almost everybody's uh, presentation has got the same uh, PowerPoint styled theme. Uh, so that means we have lost diversity, and I've marked it in, uh, uh, in, um, in the rose color, uh, as I will collect at the end, uh, the failures which have occurred during this period. The first digital projectors were also quite inferior in quality and in brightness, uh, and it took some five years or so before uh, the quality of the presentations got back to what had been done with projectors and slides previously. But even a uh, bigger disruption was the need to have an interface which worked well between the projector, the conference center computer, and the computer that the user has used to make his talk. Uh, we had a decade of fairly massive disruption in which entire talks could be almost destroyed by uh, a computer uh, making interface not working correctly, either messing up or not projecting the image at all. Finally, I guessed about 2010, uh, the interface problems were finally solved and now everything runs smoothly again. This uh, panel is about the interactions which occur during a conference, because after all, it's these personal interactions which are the main rationale for collecting people together in a meeting rather than just publishing a paper. So here are a few thoughts on how that has evolved over time. The most uh, effective interactions are the questions and answer sessions. If you have a small number of people, you can interrupt a speaker in real time, but that is quite impractical for large meetings. In large meetings, the normal procedure is to have a question time and discussion period uh, after the talks or sometimes after a group of talks. Um, and this is an extremely important difference between a published paper uh, and a presentation in a meeting. Everybody present in the meeting has an opportunity to ask questions and hears the discussions. At this point, session chairs don't always, but can play a very strong role. They can focus the discussion if they are well aware of the topic and the audience, they can even select the questions so that they are grouped in a more effective way. 
They will certainly shut down uh, discussions which are off topic and they can avoid uh, inappropriate discussions taking place. So as we move into the future, I've marked this in yellow because I think a lesson to be learned is to set up structures so that the chairs are still able to play this effective role. However, I now have a bunch of negatives. Up until about 1980, these questions and answers uh, were recorded and published, and it was done uh, in quite a, uh, uh, an organized way. When you set up a big conference, you would have uh, a, a group of helpers uh, who would have sheets of paper, templates, which they would give to everybody who asks a question, and the questioner would later then write his question down on the paper. These would all be collected up, and of course it would have the names of the person asking the question, and the name of the speaker that the question referred to. Uh, these were collected. All of these were given to the speakers. The speakers could then read the written version of the question and provide a written version of their answer. Occasionally, when meetings were extremely well organized, these would then be posted on notice boards so everybody who participated in the conference could then revisit the questions and answers. And in fact, if they thought uh, things had been changed or were misleading, uh, they could even suggest changes to the questions and answers. Uh, all of this information was collected up and included in the publications of the proceedings. I do some work now on the history of science. And when I go back and look at proceedings of old conferences, it is these question and answer sessions which tell you most about the mood, the topic, the emotions, and what people were really thinking at the time. This unfortunately disappeared somewhere around 1980 uh, to 1990. I think it disappeared because there was an assumption that the fancy new communication technologies would replace this uh, uh, handwritten question and answer. So emails were often sent uh, after a conference, but these were person to person, not normally shared by all participants, and very rarely collected together into the publication. Audio, audio recordings were taken as it was thought that that would be a really easy way to solve this problem. But in my experience, very few of those audio recordings were ever transcribed, almost never appear in the proceedings. And if you ever tried to go back and do these transcriptions, it is extremely difficult to track the identity of the speaker. Um, and so, it doesn't happen. Another thing that's important at meetings is that the participants have the opportunity to communicate between each other. And there was a very old fashioned way of doing this called the pigeonhole method. Every large conference had pigeonhole boxes set up. Uh, and if you wanted to give somebody a message, uh, you looked up their registration number and put it in the appropriate box. Um, you could put notices of group meetings in a group of boxes. You could even put artifacts if you wanted to show something you, uh, you bought or, uh, or brought to the conference. You could even put that in the box. So this worked extremely effectively. But in about 2000, it started to disappear. Uh, I remember being told when I was organizing a conference and wanted a thousand pigeonhole boxes set up, being told that's, that's old fashioned. We have better technology for communicating now, so we don't need it. Uh, but I have not yet seen an adequate substitute for the pigeonholes. Even in the age of mobile phones, it is very hard to find the numbers of the people you want to send a message to. It is quite difficult to send it to a group of people who are attending the conference or are attending the session that you want to target. Um, 
there have been attempts at conferences I have gone to to provide some support technology to do this, but up until now it has failed. And of course you can't transfer artifacts. So my great hope, and I think this is coming uh, to be the case in this meeting, is that platforms like Whova uh, will solve this problem. In about the 1970s, poster sessions appeared in conferences. Before that, people would appear at a conference, give a talk, and that was really the only way to participate. But increasingly, organizations would only give travel support for people giving talks. And the result was that there were starting to be too many talks. Um, the first uh, result of that was to cut the discussion time down, and that, of course, spoils the whole purpose of the conference, having more parallel sessions, and that's also not great if you want uh, the diversity and the innovation from, uh, from having diverse groups interacting together. The solution was the poster presentations, and for perhaps the first four or five years, this was thought to be the second class way to make a presentation at a meeting and um, was actually opposed uh, by many people. But it has slowly evolved into one of the most effective presentation platforms. There are now sparkler talks in which people have a couple of minutes to say, hey, I have a poster and this is what you'll find in it. Uh, you can then connect the person to the poster and you can go and find that person afterwards. There will be time slots when the presenter will be at the poster, and so you have direct interactions. So I've got this in yellow because I think we do have a good lesson to learn here. These exhibits and posters have been a very effective component of uh, current meetings. Now to get to a meeting in a foreign country, you have to travel there. Uh, it has been my experience that people rarely travel large distances uh, just to give a presentation at a conference, especially if you're in a faraway country like Australia. Um, you will plan to do other things. You may take a holiday while you're in uh, this country. Uh, you almost certainly will plan visits to colleagues. You will probably give talks at other organizations. The conference itself will organize excursions, banquets, museum visits, whatever. And as a result, you will become much more familiar with the culture of the country, as well as the scientific presentations in the conference. You will have friends in many countries. And, and as a uh, dedicated internationalist, I believe this is one of the ways in which science is reducing global tensions around the world. And this is a message which I think at the moment in time has become very important again. Uh, I hope in the future of virtual meetings, this aspect can somehow be kept. I also note for the people worried about footprints, and I am worried about climate change too, and think we should measure our carbon footprints. But in the case of conferences, and especially uh, people coming from large distances making the biggest footprints, that footprint is spread over many other activities and should not be simply assigned to attendance of a conference. What we hate about these conferences is the first few days when we have jet lag and we have to change time zones. However, my experience so far in virtual meetings is that a single change of time zones, moving in to a new daylight time, resets your clock pretty effectively. But being in a virtual meeting in multiple time zones, I have found very unsatisfactory. Breaking down barriers. In addition all to the scientific communication, uh, we have to worry about the barriers to making our scientific communication. And especially when you're attending conferences in foreign countries, language differences are a very obvious ones. Occasionally, 
one might have simultaneous translation, uh, but pretty unusual at most scientific conferences. It's expensive. Uh, in subsets of a conference where you have to make international decisions, uh, then this may be necessary so that everybody is on an equal basis. But what I have observed is that allowing people to ask questions in their native language and having somebody to translate those questions is very valuable because in a foreign language, if you prepare your talk in advance, you can, um, you can do it quite smoothly. But if you have to raise an impromptu question and it's not in your own tongue, it is much more difficult. The other thing that makes the communication easier is to use uh, many communication modalities. That is, you talk, you also show text. I believe that's all happening in this meeting. You can show images uh, and refer to them. And you can use expressions, you can wave your hands, uh, and this is all important. Uh, I uh, decided not to have a virtual background precisely to demonstrate that I can raise my hands and they look like hands. Uh, there are other factors, uh, age differences. Uh, it is very clear that the traditional conference structure favors the old established clique. Uh, these are people who already know each other. They will dominate the question times. But most international organizations have gone to a lot of trouble to try and um, um, provide ways to get around this. Um, and one is to make sure young people can get to conferences by providing grants. But then once they're there to have special sessions in which the young researchers can talk to each other uh, without being particularly intimidated by having a lot of senior scientists there. And somewhat successful is the concept of mentors where all the younger people in a conference have an assigned uh, more senior person. And the importance of that is to introduce them to other people because in international science, uh, linkages are incredibly important. I don't want to go into it in detail, but we have the whole issue of maintaining diversity in international conferences, gender diversity, uh, diversity by country of origin, uh, by age, uh, by religion, and they all have to be considered. So the process of putting together a conference which recognizes diversity is certainly not trivial. Uh, so you may wonder about why I put religion there, but issues such as, do you have a conference on a Saturday? Some cases not, do you have it on a Sunday? Uh, religion can even affect things like this. The evolution of blackboards into whiteboards occurred in about 1990, and they are interesting uh, uh, secondary display mechanisms, which can be quite useful. You can uh, show uh, how an equation is developed on a blackboard or a whiteboard, and you can have something uh, that sits there for the duration of a talk. So they have, a, they have some value. Then uh, whiteboard copiers uh, uh, appeared. And I brought this up partly because when I first came back to Australia in the early 90s, um, I was part of a group which was developing remote whiteboarding. Sounded like a really fantastic idea in which a distributed group of people could each have a shared whiteboard as you do now through computers. But what was interesting was uh, this was uh, pretty much a complete failure. Uh, even though the technology worked, it was cumbersome. For example, to get enough bandwidth to show good resolution images uh, of your displays or your whiteboards, you needed bandwidth and that required combining multiple telephone lines and so there was some uh, tricky technology. Uh, the systems were poorly integrated, it was hard to start them, stop them, they would fall over. Uh, the customer base that wanted to do this was too small to have a lot of investment going into it. And perhaps most importantly, 
for non-technical customers, uh, this was not the kind of solution they were looking for. So that was started even 25 years ago and failed. So don't forget to look at some of these systems when you're developing your new technology and maybe try and find out why they might have failed in the past. Uh, one technology that hasn't changed is the famous flip charts, butcher paper, uh, very effective in small groups, brainstorming sessions. Uh, and uh, it has some interesting advantages, which you also might think about as we move into the future. Um, these uh, bits of paper can be uh, pasted up around uh, um, the um, uh, break room areas. Uh, you can even uh, vote on uh, the things which you think are interesting. Uh, and it still works quite well today. And uh, I haven't seen a really good computer replacement. Finally, and it was during one of the chat sessions, which is part of this conference, one of the interesting uh, new things which I have tried to participate in. The question was, well, hasn't communications changed so drastically that the, uh, that the history of, uh, of conferences will have been uh, very much affected by this and the way we do scientific collaboration. So uh, partly for my own interest, I just quickly have summarized here uh, for the last five decades how communications has changed between scientific collaborators. When I started in this field, it was by writing letters to people in other places or other countries. Uh, airmail, time scale, a few days, it wasn't uh, disastrously long. Then if we wanted to do, for example, a joint observation where two telescopes uh, on either side of the world both look at the same object at the same time, oh, we use the telex machine because the coordinates, the technical information could be provided more or less instantly uh, and was very effective for many decades. Uh, then it was finally replaced by the facsimile machine uh, in about 1985, and that used normal telephone lines, but you could send documents, uh, text, and you could send images. So um, the communications between collaborating scientists was already quite strong. Uh, email made enormous changes in the mid 90s uh, and enabled person-to-person -person interactions uh, were facilitated. And again, you could attach text, documents, images. But we also noticed something else was happening. And that's the one I have marked uh, in rows. Uh, information overload. All of a sudden, you could dump too much information. And too much information is also not a good thing. You spend all your time reading the emails and you start to lose sight of the important bits of documents that you need. The World Wide Web came along. I don't really have anything negative much to say about that. The idea of linking information has been brilliant. The fact that you can, a group of people can jointly work on a single document. Uh, these are transformational uh, changes in technology. And we have the wonderful uh, social media shown uh, uh, with the picture over on the right. And that has had, I think, some quite unforeseen negative consequences. One of which is in the meetings in the past, people were extremely prepared and excited to show new unpublished results of exciting things they had just found out. But if you do that now, uh, it'll be tweeted to all of the rest of the world before you can publish it, uh, and that isn't nice. Hence, we have the no tweets, but just having a no tweet sign doesn't make the problem go away. So this is my final slide, and I've just summarized all the lessons to be learned in one place. You, of course, can come and look at it afterwards. They were the, uh, the yellows and the pinks from during my talk. And in conclusion, I just picked a few to highlight. High quality displays remains extremely important and effective. Some kind of questions and discussions connected around talks 
is very important. And with my international hat, using science collaboration to reduce global tension uh, is another fabulous outcome from science and conferences. And on my bad list, I am very sad that we do not adequately record discussion sessions anymore. Uh, I hope that the problem of not being able to send messages between participants will now be solved. Uh, I accept that face-to-face -face conferences do, do favor the established uh, clique, but again, uh, the new technology makes it much easier for everybody to participate. Uh, and I wish that uh, social media uh, would not have had such a negative impact. Thank you very much.